everybody. I'm very happy to um, have you all here. We have quite some interest for our webinar today. What we are going to do is we are going to um, let four of our former um, winners of our CAT Refinement Award uh, present today on their research they have conducted in the area of refinement and reduction. And then afterwards, we will have a discussion um, with you and with the panelists about their careers, where their careers have taken them then, since the, they have gotten the refinement award from CAT and also what their thoughts are on how we can further the implementation of the refinement research that has been conducted in the last 20 years. So as you know, this is a big problem. Um, that the implementation is lacking behind. We have a lot of more, uh, a lot more knowledge about um, what is good for animals in the laboratory, but the Im implementation is still a problem. So I'm going um, to start um, just introducing our first speaker today. And um, how this is going to work is that uh, I will introduce each speaker briefly, then um, they will present. And then we will have a few um, minutes for questions on each presentation. And then it, in the end, we will have the panel discussion um, and so on. So how we are going to do that is that you please post your questions in the Q&A box, and then we will answer as many as possible. So our first speaker today is Brianna Gaskill. And she rece received her BS from Kansas State University in 2004 and her PhD in animal behavior and well-being from Purdue University in 2011. And she has completed a postdoctoral position at Charles River after her graduation. And then she returned to Purdue as a faculty in 2014 and was awarded tenure in 2020. And her research has focused on developing new animal welfare assessment methodologies road and well-being um, and so on. And now this is also interesting for everybody who is, wants to pursue um, a career in refinement. She actually works for Novartis and um, I'm sure she can talk a little bit more about her career changes and why she did that. And so please, um, Brianna, go ahead and start with your presentation. Um, well, first off, I wanted to thank uh, Catherine as well as Kat for inviting me to talk about some of this really exciting work that uh, I've been conducting at Purdue University. So although I'm not, I'm not at Purdue anymore, all of this work that I'll be presenting today was, present, was, uh, was uh, completed at Purdue University. Um, and that actually two out of the three of the projects that I'm going to be talking about were actually funded by AWI and we were so thankful that we were able to secure some of that funding um, from them because there's not a lot out there and that's probably something we'll talk about a little bit today later on in the panel. Um, and one of the things that I really want you to get out of this talk is yes we're talking about rat tickling which is really fun and exciting and cool but really the story of that I'm hoping to present today is that we can develop and, and collect all of the best scientific data on these animal welfare refinement techniques. But sometimes that's not enough to actually increase the usage of these techniques in the laboratory. And that actually people themselves can be barriers to implementation and improving animal welfare. So think about that as I'm going through this example of um, that my student who you can see here on the left, Megan LaFollette, uh, did for her PhD to figure out how we can better improve implementation of animal welfare techniques in the laboratory. So before we get started, I just, this is a crash course in rat tickling and a little bit of information on its background. Um, the technique was developed and by the late Dr. Jak Panskep, who is considered the father of effective neuroscience. He ultimately was really interested in developing a technique to systematically study the neurological basis of positive affective states. And so when they were studying these positive emotions, he wanted to be able to invoke those emotions when he needed to take those measurements. So he developed a method of mimicking rat social play with his hand, um, which 
effectively has become called rat tickling. You're not actually tickling the rat, you're mimicking social play. And this is what that looks like. And so before I play this video, you're going to hear some vocalizations that are actually in the ultrasound, but we've made them audible using a bat detector. So that's the only reason you can hear these with the human ear. Um, so I'm gonna play this so that you can see what it's like. So all of those vocalizations are positive um, uh, vocalizations that have been verified using neurological uh, neuroscience to show activation in the reward center of the brain. So they're very good indicators of positive emotions in rats. But the question is, does anybody use it? So we've done uh, some systematic reviews finding that there are all of these amazing benefits to uh, reducing fear, um, causing positive emotions, improving the human animal bond, as well as handling of laboratory rats. But we were really curious if anyone was using it because in my experience, I hadn't really heard anybody talk about it. And so we wanted to see, is this something that people actually are utilizing in the laboratory in order to improve animal welfare? So we did a cross-sectional survey on tickling and some other factors back in 2018. And ultimately, and sadly, we found that lab personnel rarely uh, tickle their rats. We found that 89% of the almost 800 people that we surveyed never or rarely tickled their rats. So that was pretty overwhelming. No, people are not really using this um, very frequently or at all. So we asked them, okay, well, if you're not using it, why aren't you using it? And unsurprisingly, time was the biggest barrier that the, our respondents talked about or had comments about um, when they were telling us why they weren't using rat tickling. And in fact, 59% of the people that we surveyed said some kind of phrase related to time. So that was kind of one of the biggest barriers that we identified to implementing this procedure. We also identified personnel related factors. Now these are things where people were using phrases such as uh, a lack of proper training, there's not a lot of buy-in, um, the staff have not been educated or just a general lack of awareness of the actual technique. And so we saw 22% of people talking about uh, phrases related to that. Uh, we also found indicators of, of research related uh, comments from our survey uh, participants. And basically these were things like, you know what, we don't think we should implement this because these animals have just recently undergone a surgery or had an implantation of some kind. And we're worried about that affecting their, their health uh, as they heal from those procedures, which are completely valid. And so really we decided that really time and personnel related factors were things that we could adequately address with some subsequent follow-up research. So can we address these barriers to ultimately improve the implementation in the laboratory? So we started off thinking about this time-related aspect. So if you looked at PanSkep's original tickling protocol, it was two minutes per rat, and you did it over five days. So two minutes each day for five days. Now, if you had a study that was 50 rats, that would be up to about five hours per study. So unsurprising that people were saying that this is a major barrier to them implementing it if for every study you had to find an additional five hours to prepare for it. So we, we saw that as uh, something to try to beat. So can we figure out um, what kind of dosage of tickling is actually sufficient? And actually Panskep had never really looked into this. He had just kind of developed this, his protocol off of his own experiences. And so we decided to look at, can we uh, look at two different aspects such as duration. So can we tickle rats instead of for a total of two minutes? How about for 15, 30 or 60 seconds per rat? And then perhaps looking at the frequency. So looking at can this fit in within one, three or five days and ideally hoping that we can fit this within a typical work week. And we were really, really excited to find that uh, tickling for 15 seconds for three days was the most efficient and effective tickling dosage method. And we based this primarily off of those positive vocalizations you heard uh, by that rat during that tickling session. 
um, which are really uh, well validated as good measures for um, positive affect in rats. And we also looked at various behavior, um, such as approach to a human hand and those sort of things. And so this was pretty exciting. But if we compare that to that original protocol's uh, time investment of five hours, we were able to reduce that down to a total of 38 minutes for that same 50 number, uh, 50 rats in, in that supposed uh, project. And this was over an 1000% reduction in time investment. So we were pretty excited about um, this, this ultimate result. So it is still a time investment. You have to find about 40 minutes to fit this in, but I think that's much more reasonable than five hours. So we were pretty excited about that. Next, we asked the question about personnel barriers. Can we address this through training? So we uh, did a, um, a, a human related study. So this was kind of new for me where we are actually doing the research on the humans, not so much the, the rats. And we recruited people to three different groups, uh, 96 people in total. And they were assigned to either an online plus hands-on treatment, an online group, or a group of people who were interested in rat tickling, but we didn't train them. So the people who received one of the training related uh, treatments received an online training module. And so this is our uh, training module course uh, that you get a certificate at the end that you can, you can proudly display for all of your colleagues. And it's a very interactive uh, course where it talks about the background of the technique, the, the science used to validate it, um, some tips and tricks, and really detailed videos and images of how to do it um, if you're learning uh, from the beginning. And this took people about 30 minutes to take this course on rat tickling. So, the, uh, so both of these groups received the online training, but the online plus hands-on group received an additional hands-on training. That was about 30 minutes. And then everyone was asked to take a post-training or a survey around the same time. Obviously, the wait list didn't receive any sort of training. And we asked them about their implementation of the technique, self-efficacy, knowledge, familiarity, and beliefs surrounding rat tickling. And so we asked them um, this before they received their training, right after their training, and then two months later. And ultimately, we found that training did improve implementation, which was really, really exciting. So for our post-training group, we saw that there was only a significant increase in our training, our hands-on group um, compared to their baseline. But pretty excitingly, two months later, we found an improvement for both of our tra training treatments um, compared to their baseline methods. And we also saw benefits related to knowledge, familiarity, and self-efficacy. So ultimately, our educational framework was successful in educating and empowering laboratory animal staff to implement this technique. So to conclude, um, in general, people, uh, what I hope you take from this is that people are barriers to animal welfare improvements, but that if we take more of a social science framework, once we have this beautiful data that supports this technique, that we need to then move into this uh, different framework to get it implemented. So uh, perhaps asking people, people about the barriers to the technique, as well as identifying the benefits, and then really hopefully taking a scientific approach to address those specific barriers. And sometimes that may not be possible, but to at least approach it. But then all of the data collected and experiences then goes back to the end user to help them understand um, what kind of uh, issues they might encounter as they're trying to implement these new techniques. And with that, um, I just want to acknowledge um, Megan LaFollette, whose research PhD work this was, and then of course the Animal Welfare Institute who funded two out of the three of these projects, um, my other collaborators and funders. And then if you're interested in taking the rat tickling course, it is freely available and you can find it at this site here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bri Brianna. We don't have any questions yet, but I'm sure they will come in later. Um, that is very interesting what you presented. And just for everybody to know, 
Brianna got the award from CAT in 2015 um, for um, refinement of mice. Um, so, so that is, I asked uh, her to present on what she wanted because obviously there has some time passed since then. Um, so just that you get an idea about her current work as well. So I'm going to um, introduce you to the next speaker, Cassie Shipley. She currently works as a clinical assistant professor in the animal welfare program and a clinical veterinarian at the University of British Columbia. And she began her career as a wildlife biologist with a bachelor and masters of science in zoology. And she then went on to do a PhD in animal welfare. And more recently, she also became a doctor of veterinary medicine. And she combined her passion for animals and desire to safeguard their welfare. And that's why she has been drawn um, towards research that explores the relationship of humans with animals in science and agriculture, as well as um, with companion animals. And Cassie is committed to challenging the norms of how we care for and interact with research animals to ensure we are always seeking and implementing welfare improvements for animals used in research. She received the CAT award in 2015 um, for her work on refining animal experiments by fostering a culture of empathy and compassion. Cassie, please um, start your presentation. Thank you. Does that look good? Yes. All right. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Pat, and, and for inviting me to present today. It's an honor to be part of this panel with such esteemed colleagues. Thank you all for attending. Um, Human-Animal Relationships and Research, the Case for Caring. Today, I would like to make the case that allowing people to witness animal sentience firsthand helps motivate changes in the ways that animals are cared for and ultimately promotes refinement. In this presentation, I will show you an educational intervention intended to shift attitudes towards rats. I'll provide examples of rich housing relationships with animals and engagement of people inside and outside of our research communities. These examples are intended to provide those involved in animal care with immediate direct evidence of animal sentience with the intent to improve animal and human welfare. I will suggest that these experiences impact outcomes for individual animals, but also broader outcomes for animals by generating human motivation for advancing refinement. This is not only important to, the ethical, to ethical research, but also fundamentally important to good science. So how might these experiences improve welfare? I believe empathy is fundamental to good animal care. Empathy increases our concern for well-being of others and how we affect them. Researchers also reveal that people who have at, who believe that or attribute sentience to animals are more concerned about their welfare, behave more humanely towards them, and have more empathy to both animals and humans. A fair bit of research has been done in agriculture that has shown that attitude of stock persons towards animals is highly correlated to how animals So for example, if you feel that pigs are intelligent, then this results in lower produce and ultimately less fearful animals. Less research has been done in, the, in, the, in our own field in, in research, but there was a study by Arnold, Arluk and Sanders in the 90s who looked at lab cultures in different primate facilities. He interviewed animal care and research technician staffs, staff and found that the facilities had different cultures and animal care practices and primates had better welfare in the facility with more empathy. So empathy promotes concerns for animals, uh, uh, attitudes are impacted by beliefs about sentience and positive or negative attitudes towards animals strong, are strongly predictive of animal caretaker behavior towards animals. So therefore, I believe the research community needs people who have empathy and have positive attitudes towards animals. With these ideas in mind, what if we could shift attitudes towards a more empathetic perspective? I'll be briefly describe um, the CAT funded research, which was an educational intervention whose goal was to test if exposure to well socialized rats that demonstrate complex mental and behavioral capabilities increases empathy of those working with research animals. 
I called this the Superstar Rat Project. The intervention was designed to help capitalize on features important to fostering empathy. Uh, it, was took, it was part of a mandatory class that researchers and staff took. And the students were, who were enrolled either saw regular rats who had limited uh, socialization, and then the superstar rats who were highly trained and highly socialized. Here's the team of amazing rats, Orca, Grandin, Jane, Marie, Amelia, Anne, and Teresa. The study involved four phases, socialization and training, which were preparing the rats for the educational intervention where the rats were showcased. And then I followed that with focus groups to ask people about the, the, the impacts of the intervention, at least in the short term. So on the day of the intervention, the, this is picture Sarah and Vanessa bringing the rats into the class. And I'll just show you a quick uh, video of what the uh, people would have seen. So I won't go into much of the research, but here's just a quote to show that the intervention potential, um, some benefits. So this is a researcher's comment. I'm thinking about them differently now. We got to see more of what they're capable of and how they act. I have a bit more respect for them. One of the interesting things we did not consider going into the project was that it, uh, that was a really cool part was the impact that working with these rats actually had on our team of undergraduate students. And when we, we talked to them about this, and when we asked them about whether they brought their friends or families to, in to see the rats, this is what Sarah responded. Even the video that I have of them, which mm -hmm. is a little video I took, I don't know how many people I have shown, <laughs> just to show them how smart rats are. They're like, oh, like, oh, you work with rats, and I'm so happy I have that video to be like, yeah, like, look at how smart they are, and look mm -hmm. at what they can do. So in a sense, it ended up as if the intervention was targeted towards the researchers involved in running the study, and it was super exciting and I think something worth fostering. Just as a note, uh, 2021, we are starting a similar project uh, with mice. So now I'll turn to some other examples uh, of, of fostering positive human-animal relationships. Myself and colleagues have been investigating uh, providing temporary enriched housing or play pens uh, for animals and, and people. In the, in the case of pigs, uh, I, I engaged, excuse me, undergraduate students from a course where they trained an, uh, pigs to associate the uh, sounds with two distinct uh, play pens. One was the, the cowbell was associated with the straw pen and the novel, but just regular pen with shavings was associated a whistle. And on the day of the testing, the animals would be released and, and, and looking at the reactions of the pigs uh, who had the option of going into the pens. So here's one of the treatments. And here's the other treatment.
So I'll leave you to decide which uh, pen you think the pigs preferred. The students had a lot of fun with this. Uh, colleagues, uh, Joanna Makowska, Anna Rutuski, and Dan Weary have been doing similar things with both mice and rats. Uh, here's a picture of their mice. Um, so they're interested in benefits to welfare, but also uh, what are the people, people's views about mice after viewing them in these, uh, in these play pens? Is witnessing the complex behavior as animals rewarding? Can this engagement lead to increased morale and job satisf satisfaction for caregivers? I think it's critical to involve uh, staff and others in animal research in refinement activities. Involving undergraduates who might be future animal research in these engaging activities with animals as part of fostering a culture motivated to implement refinement. Are these people future refiners? For example, here's Lexis in, a, in an undergraduate project where she was optimizing positive reinforcement training for newly incoming pigs. And here she's training Harriet with the target stick to go in the scale. Researchers and staff report that these pigs are easy to work with and research have been asking for students to help them. While we have not implemented this approach for all animals, by testing and showcasing these methods, we have gradually been increasing the interest in using these methods in the large animal culture. We run an undergraduate program where undergraduates come in to handle rats that are used to train researchers. Here are students on orientation day. Uh, after that, they come in pairs several times a week and they interact with the rad rats. It's a very popular club. Uh, they get to learn firsthand about rats, they have fun, and they learn about animals in research. And so, and finally, I'll just consider uh, at the future lives of animals. As a thought experiment, I would like you to envision a world where research animals are just taking a sojourn in research, en route to a home with their future caretakers. How might this shift how we raise and care for animals? Like other institutions, we at UBC also have a small uh, rehoming program, and here are just a couple of examples. Here's some images of Kia, T Ki, Tia, and Sari. They were adopted uh, by a religious studies major and they're named after ancient Mesopotamia goddesses. I like her quote she gave us recently. They're very noisy at night, always rearranging things and forever doing mouse things. My housemates all like them as well. Sometimes I'll walk into my room and find one of them sitting on my bed watching the mice. We have also adopted larger animals, uh, such as these pigs who were used in diabetes research. And here's a photo of a card that the staff made to thank the researcher for allowing them to adopt the pigs. So I wonder if Ki, Tia, Sari, and others become ambassadors inside and outside the university, showing off just how interesting and important they are and how important they are, the people are who look after them. Might this provide further motivation to develop and implement refinement across all spe species? So in conclusion, I have shown some examples of the potentially powerful human and animal interaction and experiences that promote welfare for both humans and animals and how these might contribute to promoting a culture of care. So I'd like to leave you with some thoughts to consider. Perhaps it is worthwhile to allow animals to show off their complexity by housing them in appropriate environments, allow caregivers to have meaningful positive interactions with animals, support the role of those caring for animals, and allow animals and their caregivers to be ambassadors helping to change societal views of research animals and advance refinement efforts. In conclusion, I'd like to thank all of you for attending and in particular all the animals and people featured in this presentation and the funding from Johns Hopkins Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. It looks like um, we might do the questions towards the end because it looks like it takes everybody a little bit to, to think about what they want to ask. And um, so we will, we will decide um, which questions can be answered in the chat and which ones are good for later on. Our next speaker is Judith Dehaan and she is the program manager of the Open Science Program in Utrecht, the Netherlands. And she works on various topics such as pre-registration, open access and recognition and rewards to improve open science. Her background is in the biomedical sciences 
and she did her PhD at the Experimental Cardiology Department at UMC in Utrecht. And during her PhD, um, she did animal research and encountered issues such as low quality publications on animal experiments. Pre-registration can solve many of the issues um, that are now present in animal research. Therefore, she joined the preclinical trial EU team to work on improvement of animal research. And she is a member of uh, Professor Stephen Chamulot's team. And um, he is the one who received the CAT award in 2019 for promoting transparency in preclinical research through the establish establishment of the pre-registration platform, preclinical preclinic trials EU. And um, she will introduce us um, to this platform and hopefully convince um, us to use it. Thank you, Judith. Yes, thank you. Thank you for this introduction. So it's uh, actually pretty nice that uh, that I can present uh, today to you because um, actually today we have a new feature in our uh, pre-registration platform. So you're the first one actually to know uh, of this new feature. So that's really great. Um, so this talk will be a little bit different than the previous ones. I will not show any animal experiments, but I will talk about pre-registration of preclinical studies and why we think that this uh, can lead to a reduction in refinement of animal studies. So I present this on behalf of the preclinical trial team that is shown here. So we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, people from the field that are, are um, actually uh, in this steering committee uh, of preclinical trials and all are very motivated to um, make sure that in the future all animal research is pre-registered. And um, Stephen Chamelow was already mentioned, and we will also have a new team member uh, soon. But what does pre-registration actually mean? Um, you want to share your slides? I shared my slides, right? Nine, no, sorry, they are not there. Just, um... let's see. I thought I shared. Do you see it now? Yeah. Ah, okay. So <laughs> then, then this makes more sense. So this is the team um, uh, with uh, Stephen Chamelo in the top um, um, and, and all the others from different uh, medical centers and universities, or even from uh, Netherlands Heart Institute uh, of the Netherlands. They're all part of the preclinical trial team. Um, but what does pre-registration mean? So um, it's actually that you uh, pre-register your experiment before you start doing it. So the, everything that you are planned to do you um, uh, you register somewhere online with a date stamp so that in uh, in the future you can look back on what you actually decided that you wanted to do and see if you followed up your initial plans. And in various fields, this is already the norm for doing research. So for example, in the clinical field, uh, it's mandatory to have your studies pre-registered um, before you can even publish on clinical uh, on clinical studies. So for example, clinicaltrials.gov is a website where you can register your clinical trials. Um, also in the Netherlands, pre-registration is uh, more common now in the uh, field of uh, psychology because uh, there were some issues with fraud. Um, and this in this field, they, um, um, they picked up pre-registration as a form of preventing uh, uh, for example, fraud. Um, uh, so they, they picked up and it's more norm there. So we think that also in the preclinical field, pre-registration can be very beneficial. So why, why would we want to do um, actually pre-registration in the preclinical field as well? That's because there is a huge translational failure from, from animal research to clinical practice. As you can see here in this graph, this is on various, uh, in various fields, you see the rate of success, the percentage of success of all combined uh, drug studies. And you see that the overall percentage of success is only 11%. So that's really low. So 
So from all uh, animal studies for doing drug interventions, only 11% leads to success in clinical practice. Um, and of course, we think that that's too low. We are using animal studies to, um, to, that can lead to um, beneficial clinical practice. So uh, we want to improve this uh, 11%. So why is this 11, um, this success rate so low? Um, that has various reasons, of course, and a, a huge part is because of methodological, methodological um, um, mispractice. So it's, it could be improved. That's because, for example, um, we have the case of cherry picking. So um, when researchers make a manuscript and, and they uh, submit it to a journal, they pick only the experiments that show the most positive results. So you do, for example, 10 different kind of experiments, uh, and then you pick the one that shows uh, an, a, a, diff a different result between the, the control group and the experimental group. And all the other experiments that did not show any difference, you leave out because that is not interesting enough to show in your manuscript. So that's one thing. Um, then the other thing is that the uh, quality of the preclinical research that is published right now has a pretty low quality. So, for example, blinding of animal experiments is not something that is done uh, usually. A sample size, size calculation for doing your preclinical study is not done. Um, conflict of interest is not mentioned. So, the quality is pretty low of the preclinical study. And there is uh, publication bias. So only the positive results are published. So only the, the, the drugs that show a, uh, an, an effect in the animal studies will be sent to a journal and will be accepted for publication. So all the negative studies, they, they end up in a file drawer uh, and they will never be seen by other researchers. So people don't know that these experiments were actually uh, performed. And we think that uh, pre-registration of, um, of your study uh, can circumvent um, these problems. So if you say by forehand which, which experiments you're going to do, you cannot cherry pick at the end which ones you are going to uh, publish because you, you said you're going to do those 10 experiments. If you're only going to show one in your manuscript, that will look weird. Um, so people can ask, like, hey, what, what happened to all the other nine experiments that you plan to do? Did you not perform them or did they show a negative result? Um, it can also help to improve the quality of the publications because by filling out this pre-registration protocol, you are asked, are you going to blind your, um, um, your experiment? Are you going to do a sample size calculation? So you are... Uh, drawn, the attention is drawn to these kind of quality checks for doing your research, and you think beforehand of what you can do to improve your in, improve your um, your study. And the third uh, part, um, the the publication bias. You uh, pre-register your study, so there should be a follow up by a, a manuscript usually. So at least the um, the publication bias in is in uh, is inside insightful so you can see it now what is been published and what's not been published so you can ask hey is there a publication coming or is it a negative study um, and you can and you can look at that you can even uh, maybe uh, connect it to a um, publication platform where you can publish negative results as well so with the um, uh, award that we got from the CAT, uh, we made a movie to actually illustrate uh, what we're doing at preclinical trials. Um, that was actually suggested also by CAT, so we were very happy with that. And I'll show you now the video that we made, uh, which will explain a little bit uh, more in depth what the, the idea is about preclinicaltrials.eu. Nowadays, still many diseases cannot optimally be treated. Despite the improvement of many medical treatment techniques, testing on animals is often still required. With performing animal studies, it must be done very carefully and well thought through before starting. However, not all information on previously performed experiments is currently publicly available. 
which in part may be caused by publication bias. Journals are more prone to publish articles with positive data than neutral or negative outcomes. As a result, researchers may also be inclined to only show their most positive outcomes and ignore or not mention neutral or negative results in their manuscript. This cherry-picking together with publication bias may lead to an overestimation of the tested treatment methods, leading to translational failure from animal studies to clinical trials. On top, many animal experiments are unnecessarily repeated due to lack of proper registration of conducted animal experiments. To prevent those biases, researchers can register their study protocols prior to the study on preclinicaltrials.eu for free. Researchers can access our database where registered protocols are publicly available and searchable, enabling them to look up which animal experiments have already been performed. This way, we can increase transparency and improve quality of research while reducing unnecessary repetition of animal experiments. Ultimately, this will improve clinical research and result in better healthcare. Preclinicaltrials.eu Yes, but that was in, in short uh, what we are aiming for, and hopefully we'll, we'll uh, reach this goal uh, uh, in the future. Nowadays. Let's see. Go to the next slide. So today uh, we have an update on our website. Um, you can go on our website and uh, look at previous uh, submissions from, uh, from other people now without even making a login. If you want to register your protocol, you, you can create a login for free. It's, it's very easy. Um, and you can, can pre-register your studies here. Um, and the other feature that we added, which is for people who work with the PRIS system to, um, um, to uh, make their work protocol for working with animals, you can import your work protocol here and you don't have to fill out all the fields uh, by yourself anymore. So this is something that at least is used in Europe a, a lot. So I don't know if that, this is also the system that is used in the US or in other countries, um, but we want to make it as easy as possible for researchers to uh, pre-register their uh, studies. So if we can, unload the burden of administration, we want to do that. So we are also continually working on uh, making these import systems for other um, animal work protocol systems that are used in different countries. Um, so if you uh, are interested in something like this, you can always send us an email and we will try to work on this as well. So with that, um, I want to end and thank you all for uh, letting me present here. Thank you, Judith. That was very interesting. And I really hope that many people will be inspired by this and, and start using it. I think there was also um, like a thought about making this um, required by the Dutch government. I don't know if that was followed up on or not. It's not uh, mandatory yet, but we did get some uh, funding from the government. So they're really supporting this initiative and it's talked about with in the government and they all support it and say that it, this should be done, but it's not mandatory yet, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we have, uh, in, as you know, shortly after US was launched, um, Germany also launched one, which I think could have been combined <laughs> for one is enough for everybody, because there was also a question in the in the Q&A um, if everybody can or anybody can register. Um, and of course, yes, um, that's possible. And that's yes. the idea, obviously. Um, as you said, it's compared to the clinical trials um, yeah, pre-registration that is actually required by law. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Judith. Um, I think we can answer some more questions later in the panel discussion. Now I would like to um, introduce our last speaker before we move on to the discussion, Becca Franks. Um, she is a research scientist in the Department of Environmental Studies at New York University where she studies animal behavior, particularly as it relates to the well-being of aquatic organisms. 
and she has a doctoral degree in psychology from Columbia University and she did a Killam postdoctoral research fellowship in animal welfare at the University of British Columbia at their animal welfare program. The same group um, Cassie Shipley is also part of. And she bridges diverse fields uh, with the goal of understanding the interests, motivations, preferences, social relationships, and emotions of fish and non-fish species alike. Becker received the CAT Award in 2014 for exploring how cognitively challenging feeding regimens affect fish welfare. And she will show us um, some of the video footage and talk a little bit more about that now. Thank you so much, Becker. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for having me here. Thank you, Catherine, for organizing this amazing panel. Um, it's just great to see all these different streams of research coming together and resonating with each other. So it's really an honor to be here. Um, and thank you all participants for coming. It's great to see so many people engaging in these issues. Um, so the title of the talk um, that I prepared for today is what does a good life look like for a zebrafish? And I added a subtitle um, and why does it matter? So I think that um, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about why it matters and not so much time to answering the question because I suppose I don't actually know what a good life looks for and instead of advocating that it's an important question to ask. So um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, one of the reasons why it matters is that fish are now um, one of the most used species in science around the world. Um, and we know the least about their welfare. Um, it's just very recent that we started investigating their welfare. So it's a very new field and there's a lot of work to do. So that's at least one reason. Um, before I get started though, I wanna thank um, various institutional support, of, including of course, importantly, CAT, um, and uh, I've gotten institutional support from a number of fantastic um, universities and centers, and of course, amazing colleagues and uh, advisors and research assistants. And um, everyone was really instrumental in, in generating and helping me think through these ideas and, 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 and also of course, collecting the data and writing up the results as well. So, um, a lot of my thinking around this um, has come through conversations with Joanna Makowska and Dan Weary, and in particular, this paper that they wrote in 2020 um, called A Good Life for Laboratory Rodents. And in this paper, they propose thinking about a good life um, along a continuum for uh, laboratory rodents, and then in different areas or domains. So there's the physical environment and you can think about having good bedding, um, providing play pens, providing uh, that are outside of the home cage, providing complexity in the home cage, improving designs, um, but then also even moving towards thinking about free ranging, studying free ranging rodents, which is uh, sounds pretty radical, I think, compared to what we usually think of when we think of uh, rodents in science, but it's actually um, been done for a number of years by various groups um, with to uh, great success. Um, interactions with humans, which we've heard a lot about today, how important that is. So, you know, focusing on, you know, improving handling and restraint, but also getting to socialization and maybe even cooperation, bi-directional um, uh, coordination. And then beyond research, again, something that's come up today is thinking about their, the full life of, of the animals. And, and as Kathy mentioned, maybe even thinking about um, the, the involvement of animals in science as being something that they pass through, that they're really um, in people's homes and, and we reconceive of them as, as pets rather than um, research um, subjects. So these goals, I... Um, call them, this is not what, what uh, uh, Joe and Dan refer to, but I, I call them incremental goals and foundational goals. So thinking about things that, that are, are necessary improvements uh, that are incremental 
or actually starting to rethink foundationally how we think about animals and science. And, and with that foundational change, we can imagine that the ideal future would be that we only have animals involved in science for the sake of the individuals themselves. So that is potentially a, a goal that we could all get behind. And really what you know would hold us back is that we think that we aren't gonna be able to generate enough information if we only had animals involved in science um, for the sake of their own, you know, well-being. Um, so this really gets us down to the root of refinement and the logic of refinement is a harm-benefit analysis. So on the one hand, you have the benefit to science or humanity weighed against the harm to sentient beings. And if for now, just for the sake of the conversation, let's just hold the benefit to science and humanity constant and consider the full range of what is possible for a sentient being from extreme suffering to a good life. So when you see extreme suffering, there is of course a great moral urgency to alleviate that suffering. It's very salient, it's very important um, to uh, move away from extreme suffering. There's a, a, a very, a heavy uh, duty to, to engage in that sort of work. Um, but that shouldn't come at the expense of also considering a good life in terms of the repertoire of what we do, because if the science is held constant as it is for the sake of argument right now, there is obviously a moral imperative to aim for the good life because anything less than a good life, all things being equal, is essentially a harm. And if there's no change in the benefit, then you're just left with not doing as much as you possibly can to give an animal a good life. So there is at least a need to be considering this end of the spectrum. Otherwise, we're just simply not fulfilling the, the um, moral equation that we've uh, agreed upon as, as uh, permissible um, to involve animals in science. So sort of to explore that in zebrafish, um, so this is a typical laboratory housing for zebrafish. This is more similar to what their natural uh, environment would look like than if you zoom in underwater, it might look something like this. So it's possible that in the lab doing some minor modifications, including some plants, changing the light cycle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you would be able to get all the way to a good life. Um, but of course, it's also possible that that is impossible to achieve in the lab. And that if you don't consider the other end of the spectrum of animals engaging in the full complexity of a natural environment, you're basically cutting yourself off at the, the low end of the welfare spectrum and ignoring the upper end of the spectrum. And without actually engaging in the research at the other end of you know, the natural life and what life is like for these fish and what their behaviors are like and how you know they express uh, different sorts of uh, social relationships etc cetera, etc cetera, um, you simply won't know it will be an unknown whether or not you're in the higher bar uh, here or if you're in the lower situation here where you've truncated off the end of the, the spectrum and and if you have truncated off the end of the expect spectrum, you're not going to be able to adequately assess welfare. You won't even be able to know what is a normal behavior versus an abnormal behavior. You won't know what is a normal behavioral frequency versus abnormal behavioral frequency. For example, aggression could be extremely elevated, but it becomes normalized if all you study is the animals within the standard laboratory housing environments. There might be behaviors that are missing from the repertoire of the species that would normally be considered to be an indicator of, um, you know, a problem or diminished welfare. If, you know, for example, primates don't engage in grooming behavior. That's seen as a problem. But if you don't know that primates engage in grooming behavior because you've never studied them in their natural environment, you won't know that it's missing. You can have disrupted and um, dysfunctional social structures that aren't going to be identified as such and normally would be flagged as a welfare problem. And then of course, sort of most perniciously, you can have anhedonia. 
So one thing that happens when animals are suffering or having poor welfare is they disengage uh, from the world and they don't have as strong motivations for achieving um, positive outcomes for themselves or uh, avoiding negative outcomes for themselves. So you're almost reducing their sentience. Uh, and it's not, and if you don't know that that's happening, it's, it, you just, again, normalize it and think that, uh, that, that everything's okay. So if we return back to this logic of refinement and harm benefit analysis, and we maybe are operating in a world where we've truncated off the good life and we don't know what a good life looks like for uh, the species under consideration, we're leaving a moral obligation unfulfilled. Uh, we also aren't going to know the true status of the animals that were under consideration. But it's worse than that, because as I was alluding to, we're undermining the very reason to take the harm seriously in the first place, the sentience, the sapience, the cognitive capacity of these individuals. So one of the things that we know is that when animals live in you know, complex environments with adequate social structures and low levels of stress, um, periodic challenges, uh, they have a much greater cognitive potential than uh, they do when they're in very barren, diminished environments. And so we might be misgaging the cognitive complexity of the uh, individual species under consideration. We also find that personalities don't develop, individual differences don't develop in barren environments compared to complex environments. Social relationships again can get disrupted. And you know, basically you're diminishing the very reason to motivate caring for the animals in the first place. So it's, it's undermining the whole system. And worse than that, as we just heard, um, you know, there's this huge problem in science with translation and replicability. And a lot of researchers are starting to propose that part of the problem might be the research environment for the individual animals. And that if you're housing them in these barren environments, that are very abnormal considering their natural history and their evolutionary trajectories and what they would experience in a normal ecological intact system, you're ending up potentially studying idiosyncratic, unstable and easily perturbed and abnormal systems. And so then you're actually no longer holding the science constant, you're actually getting worse science that potentially makes it difficult to find the same things from laboratory to laboratory and then you're making inferences to normal populations when in fact you should be only making inferences to abnormal populations. So in essence if you ignore this good life under the spectrum even though it might not have the same moral urgency as uh, you know avoiding extreme suffering the the entire structure of the justification of the practice of involving animals in science is undermined and called into question and uh, you know potentially just leaving us in a, a very very bad place where we're inflicting harms without very much benefit if any benefit to um to anyone so that's at the stage for what i was interested in um, in thinking about outside of standard laboratory environments, what might we still be missing about what it is like to be a fish or what their, uh, you know, what elements are important to their lives. Um, and so I, um, we were successful in getting this CAT award, which really facilitated our ability to begin with more naturalistic housing and then ask the question, in addition to this naturalistic housing, might the fish still benefit from having a cognitively challenging feeding regime, cognitive stimulation, cognitive enrichment, um, in addition to the a more naturalistic housing. Um, so that was totally instrumental and uh, basically career changing for me that I was able to do this. So we were able to set up um, tanks that looked like this rather than the standard laboratory housing. Um, we had about 10 fish per tank. They were mixed sex. Um, and we did, you know, the sort of regular uh, laboratory care um, beyond that. And so my question really was, is this enough? Like just housing animals in this kind of environment is much better, potentially more naturalistic at least for sure 
than a standard laboratory environment, but what about cognitive stimulation? So um, this is now when we <laughs> veer into story. So I'll give you a story of, of what happened when we started asking those questions. So first of all, I wanna show you a video of what the fish's baseline behavior looks like. And so here you can see, hopefully the video is not too jerky um, uh, coming across the internet, but you can see the fish swimming around. They're maintaining some distance from each other, sort of spread out using as much space as they can, doing little chases and charges towards each other, engaging in, in uh, social behaviors um, and, you know, ba but basically sort of spreading out um, as much as possible. Uh, and, and uh, not not coordinating very much at all. And so then uh, to, to think about the cognitively challenging feeding regime, um, we, we had a pilot tank that we were experimenting with, uh, you know, playing around with training the fish uh, in various sorts of ways to, to know when they were going to get fed in one location versus another location. So we were just starting out. Um, and we were recording what we were doing, and then we had just finished with the training session, and the fish began doing this. So again, I hope you can see this, but what, what we observed was a dramatic shift. Uh, this is not just an, a continuation of their previous social behavior. There seems to be a binary shift where they're now engaging in a completely different social behavior, where they're much closer together. You don't see any of those little agonistic interactions of chases and charges, and they're coordinated in their swimming. They're all facing in the same direction. Um, and, uh, you know, just a qualitatively different way. And, and they ended up doing this for about an hour after, after the training. So we were really struck by that, that their social behavior had such a dynamic range to it. So we turned to the literature to try to understand what this might mean. I mean, uh, you know, just looking at that naively, not knowing what it's like to be a zebrafish, that looks like a very pleasant sort of state to be in. But, you know, was there any science to back that up? And what we ended up finding is that there's very, there was very little at the time describing anything, anything coming close to that sort of behavior, let alone thinking about social, the, the role that their social dynamics might play in welfare. So we ended up writing a review paper as a result. And then we did end up doing a cognitive enrichment type study where we gave them a free choice exploration opportunity, which dramatically changed their affiliative behavior in the direction that along the lines of what we just saw. So when they had the opportunity for free choice exploration, which provides cognitive stimulation for you know, opportunities to explore, um, they had more uh, cohesion and they had more coordination and they had less aggression. And then finally, we were able to observe this sort of uh, extreme uh, uh, cohesiveness and coordinatedness um, uh, uh, that the fish did spontaneously throughout the day um, because we were video recording them and, and uh, taking their behavior quite seriously. So we were able to describe them engaging in this behavior um, in, a, in another separate paper that we um, wanted to evaluate it against uh, the criteria for a positive emotional behavior. So in this paper, um, and then I'm wrapping up, we had this behavior that we called heightened shoaling, and we took a bunch of different metrics, but this one is the most striking, um, is the interfish distances in a baseline randomly selected period throughout any time of the day is what you saw in that first baseline video where they're sort of scattered all over the tank and the interfish distances are quite far apart. And then during heightened shoaling, they clump together. And this is not just at the extreme end of baseline, it's a completely bimodal distribution. It's a totally different um, um, behavior that they're engaging in. It's not just the high end of normal behavior, it's qualitatively different. And we also were able to show that there's a very high participation rate, which suggests that it's an attractive 
um, attractant to the other fish. Uh, we saw low signs of negative affect. There was a high degree of synchronous, synchronicity between the fish and it was protracted. It lasted for long periods of time. So the median time was seven minutes, but it lasted up for half an hour. And in this case, it was spontaneous that it seemed to be driven by internal group dynamics. So when you have all of these different criteria, it, it is beginning to be you know, consistent with positive emotional behavior as we would identify in primates engaging in sort of like group grooming behavior or something like that. Um, so it's an indicator of, of, of uh, new behavior that had not been observed or described in the literature before. And we were able to see it simply because we housed them in this um, uh, more naturalistic environment. So in some returning to this sort of logic of refinement, you know, extreme suffering is absolutely necessary to address and of high, high concern and urgency. But we also can't, uh, as a field, ignore the, the higher end of the spectrum as well of the good life for all the reasons that we've outlined here. And also keeping in mind this like ultimate goal, even if we don't think it's gonna happen tomorrow, that, that a, a better future for everyone potentially would be science that's done only for the sake of the individual animals themselves. Um, and, and that you know, we are able to move to a full, full replacement and reduction uh, model for um, uh, laboratory science. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, open up to the bigger group. Thank you very much, Becca. So everybody can switch on, um, the panelists can all switch on their cameras, please. Um, and then we can kind of start to talk a little bit more about, yeah, the refinement research you're doing and um, yeah, what, what we want to do, what, we, what goal, what's our goal with this? And just to um, follow up on what Becca just said, um, the newer definition of refinement is that we don't only minimize pain and distress and uh, suffering, but we actually want to improve the well-being of those animals. So talking about a good life, I think, is what we, we should be doing. And of course, there are limitations of what is possible in the laboratory, um, but I think we haven't reached um, our limitations yet in terms of, you know, can we, for example, really provide um, a semi-naturalistic um, environment? I think we could. Um, I'm just putting out some thoughts there. Um, you also um, know about um, Garrett Lavis' work, who actually used to do um, mouse research, and then he decided that the mice in the lab, um, he couldn't get any um, valid data from them. And he actually proposes um, that they are monitored in the wild. We can maybe discuss a little bit about um, options for that. Obviously we can't do all the research uh, that is currently done with those animals. Um, but yeah, just just to, to cite, um, say something from, from the paper he wrote in 2017, where he calculated the standard floor sizes um, the animals have and compared them uh, or compared them what they have in the wild. And for mice, he said um, that the standard mouse cage is 280,000 times smaller than the animal's natural home range. And uh, for rhesus uh, monkeys, it was um, 7 million fold smaller, like the, the enclosures in the laboratory. And obviously that has an impact. So I just want to open it up um, to the panelists um, to give their thoughts. You're all doing research to improve lives of animals in the laboratory um, to find ways to reduce the number of animals used. Um, so what are your thoughts um, on, yeah, what, what can be done to, to improve that, yeah, our findings are actually used in practice? It's a big question, but just I throw it out there. So I, I'll jump in there because um, I feel like that's fairly close to what uh, my presentation was was talking about. So rat tickling had been around, I think, when we started um, 
working with the technique maybe back in 2016-ish. And so at that point, it, the technique had been published for over 16 years and um, really hadn't been taken up by the laboratory animal community. And so I think that we need to go beyond just doing the research to validate the techniques. I mean, that's obviously the first step. But, um, you know, once we're able to show that beneficial data, so the tickling shows overwhelmingly um, all kinds of positive benefits. So going beyond elimination of the negative, but actually introducing positive experiences for the rats. Um, but nobody was using it. And so just really trying to think about how we have to take that data to the next step to figure out and using some of these social science frameworks in order to figure out how we can choose to change human behavior, which is, which was a huge step out of my uh, normal research areas, but it was really fascinating and really exciting because I know for me as a research, as a welfare scientist, I'm excited about improving the lives of animals. And I do the, the science to figure out how to do that. And you just assume that once you show people the data, they're like, yeah, of course, let's, let's start trying that out. But unfortunately, that's just not how it works. And so trying to take some of those next steps to provide the information back to the people who are actually taking it up in order to make that implementation training, et cetera, to, to make that more fruitful. So maybe I can add to that from like a more institutional like level, because I'm not working on, on animals myself anymore, but we are working with changing the behavior of, of, of scientists uh, by, by working on open science, for example. And I think that you have a very valid point, like what when are researchers going to pick up the, all the knowledge that is already there? And I think one of the issues now is in the incentive and rewards of, of, of scientists. So how are you rewarded? What is, what is your motivation of doing things? And now um, it's, it's, it's very focused on research output, um, so do you have your publications? Uh, where is it published? Is it a nature publication or is it somewhere in a, a journal with a low impact factor? And that's all driving uh, um, what we have to do as, as researchers, right? So the focus is, is, is really on, on, on that. And if the focus should, should shift a little bit to the quality of, of what you're doing, and that includes also the quality of the animal experiments that are doing with tickling you uh, apparently improve the, the quality of the, the behavior of the rats and it will actually lead to better results as well. Um, if we shift from the research output to research process, I think that will help uh, researchers to also to, to take up these, this, this, uh, this knowledge that is already out there. I think what uh, both Brianna and Judith, that like the, these different levels that need to be, uh, I think, uh, included, right? There's the, there's the people in the labs and then there's these larger systemic um, levels that need to be incorporated as well. And so, and I think you've nice, sort of nicely point out the two examples because, and, and then, and, you know, Becca brought in nicely the, you know, the fundamental, um, um, potential flaws with the the scientific the animal model here which i think are are probably going to be your biggest influencers ultimately with the scientific community right and and and, and as and as she pointed out people are starting to consider this because they are recognizing that these are impacting data and you know the biggest when you're working in in the field the all you know the first response out of anybody's mouth is well that's going to change our data when you implement something in it's like well yes what the bigger the bigger worry is is that you that your data is already flawed right and so if you don't take those into consideration you 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 have confounds that are either not accounted for or whatever or your 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 whatever your your reproducibility translatability is questioned so i do think that as a larger scientific uh, enterprise culture those things have to be brought up to the forefront and some of that does require more research uh, to understand these how these things impact which it's always hard because there's always going to be a need for research um, and you're never going to have all the answers. We still have animals currently in the system. And so 
I also implore researchers who like animal welfare research, but also others who work in these fields to be integrating kind of practical applied questions in their work so that we can translate some of those things on a day-to-day -day basis for animals so that uh, we're not always limited by the sort of, well, you know, whatever, the, just staying at the sort of basic from level of understanding behavior, which is important, I get it, but thinking about the applied parts of it for, for the animals that are being used. I uh, heartily agree and echo everything everyone was saying. I think, and actually it was in Kathy's presentation, so Kathy already said this, but I'll just <laughs> signal boost it that, you know, uh, you make time for things that you care about. And if you don't care about something, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, and, and incentives don't matter, um, you know? So, so really, I think also in the mix has to be um, uh, that there is a base level of care for these animals and that the extent to which the research that we do highlights their sentience, their cognitive complexity, their social relationships, their ability to bond with humans. Those are all kinds of things that motivate humans to care. And so I think that those those aspects of our studies are, are really like feed into these other things that are absolutely crucial. Um, so, yeah. I might jump on to that, uh, Becca. You brought up a really good point about, um, you know, when we start to people do things based on whether they actually care about them or not. One of the things that was kind of a a side observation from some of the tickling work that we did when we were surveying our participants, one of the things we were worried about was that if we we're trying to influence people to start incorporating tickling more often, we were worried that there might be a negative side effect of some additional compassion fatigue that might happen once you've created that bond. And actually we found the opposite. So there was no um, major problems, at least from this, this survey, no issues of compassion fatigue when those bonds do have to most likely be broken with the rats, but actually we saw an increase in compassion satisfaction in that because they got to do these really fun and enjoyable things with the rats, they were showing more increases in, in wanting to do more for them and really getting excited about making their lives better. So it was really cool. We saw this really nice balance between you know, improving animal welfare actually improved human welfare as well. So I think that there's something to be said about that for sure. I, I would echo, echo that in my own results as well, yeah. Brianna. I had that same, a same uh, um, participants did say that same thing, right? They actually felt better, better about what they were doing because they felt they were doing bet more for their animals. And so it made them feel better. And I, I think in the human medicine literature, where we have more evidence or research on these topics around compassion, fatigue, empathy, working with patients, et cetera. There's also some evidence to support that in health, healthcare workers that if they have more empathy, even though it, it is emotionally challenging, ultimately they feel better about what they're doing and it helps them to cope with what they're doing better. Yeah, what I also um, find very important um, to to let everybody know, for example, at the moment, um, this this webinar is actually part of a refinement, a new refinement course um, at Johns Hopkins, um, our center um, initiated, and um, it's important to tell the students that, of course, the data has changed by what, depending on what you do with the animals, but I think you all gave uh, good indicators why this is very beneficial, um, because otherwise, I mean, the data is already influenced by so many factors. I just remember when the whole um, environmental enrichment um, discussion came up, like that was now over 10 years ago when, when there was a heated debate about um, can we actually give uh, any kind of environmental enrichment because it does have an influence. But it's always important to, to, to let everybody know that there are so many influences on those animals in the laboratory um, and at least uh, you know what, how you influence them in that way. 
So um, what are your thoughts and also from your personal experience, um, because all of you have worked with animals, even so Judith is now not working with them anymore, but she has in the past, as she said, um, what is your experience from, from that time or now? How can you make changes? Because as we know, it's very hard to make changes, even so they are there might be evidence or are evidence driven in this case um, of all the refinement research data we have. What are your thoughts and why it's so difficult and what are your personal ways of making a difference in your own institutions? For me, what, what was striking, so I, I worked during my PhD with, uh, with mice mainly, is that, um, that you do whatever uh, anyone else is doing in the lab. So uh, you learn from your, your colleagues and uh, you just do uh, what you have been told. And um, uh, during your PhD, you, you, you start to realize that maybe what, uh, what everyone is doing is not, uh, not the best thing to do and that you should, might be, uh, should be, you should be doing something else. And then it's really hard to change because indeed, it will change your data and you're halfway during your PhD. You don't want to start ch changing things or uh, yeah, you can't compare it anymore in the middle of your, um, of your work. You have, yeah, you don't want to want to change. Um, so I think uh, it's important to start early on um, with making people aware of what they are doing. So before you start your PhD, uh, you have to do at least in analysis, you have to do in uh, like an animal experiment course, then I think that that is the place where you want to find this knowledge on on um, what animal welfare can do also for your experiments and what you should do to have good quality animal experiments with uh, uh, with everything that that's been said here that should be um, uh, should be done. Um, so that was for me. Um, that would be the place where I, I would have learned like to learn uh, all these things. Yeah, I guess this it is this is a very <laughs> this is a very tough question. It's very frust can be very frustrating when you work on the inside as I do uh, because things seem extremely slow as we've all co commented on um, uh, but uh, you know in my own time at the university the, there has been incremental changes for sure it's just sort of kind of keeping up and which is where I've taken advantage of undergraduate students who are not uh, under the pressures of get needing to get stuff done they're just there to add this benefit to all the other projects and we try as much as possible to have them piggybacking with other projects um, so it does take a lot of I have to do a lot of communicating with researchers to bring on students and try to make cases for how it might be useful. Uh, but there are definitely limitations for that. So then it's sort of in the, in the one case, we had some wound healing studies where we had, we had researchers who were particularly keen and there was no real, they couldn't see any scientific reason for not having like, you know, the pigs undergoing positive reinforcement training and various things. So uh, they were a really good asset because they then themselves saw the benefits, the staff saw the benefits, and all of a sudden they were like, every time I didn't have a student, they were like, oh my god, you got to get a student, like it's so much better, and, uh, and, and the researchers themselves started kind of articulating that. Now, you know, it has, having said that, it's not that this, we have made such success that this is why it's used all the time. Um, but there are incremental changes, which I guess I have to try to convince myself that is, is good, uh, even though it can be very frustrating sometimes and you feel like you're not getting anywhere. Um, but I do think the, 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 uh, the cultural, the, you know, as myself being, uh, having done a lot of social science work in the past, cultures are important and, and how scientists become scientists is really important. And I've had, comments from scientists themselves who, who in some of my focus groups who, who had sort of junior scientists with more senior scientists, mostly like postdocs versus beginning. And they would comment on things like, oh yeah, young scientists are much more sensitive to the animals and you know, they're more concerned. And over time you, you, you lose that sometimes intentionally because it was in their mind a coping mechanism. 
um, but also just part of the culture and there are the, the, the culture of training scientists. And this is also documented in anthropology literature. And so it's very important to pay attention to that kind of thing so that over time you can shift the culture and it's hard. And there's all sorts of other examples in agriculture or whatever, where you have longer term, you know, I don't, it's not necessarily old and junior, but, but um, sometimes you have to shift managers and these, these more, you know, influential roles within cultures of labs um, in order to get the trickle down effect with the lab, because, even in my intervention, you would have a lot of positive feedback, but people, and we did interview people long-term, which we'd like to continue doing, but you know, they get back to their labs and that culture immediately comes back, right? Oh, I gotta, I gotta follow what people are saying, people are doing, and, and, it's, and it's hard for people to step out of that. Um, so whatever we can do to, to um, you know, allow for those changes so that it's acceptable, um, uh, I think is really important, but it, it, it does, sometimes it takes big shifts in cultures to make that happen um, as, our, as uh, has been shown in some, in some of the primate lab research. I think I might be an outlier here. Um, I, I, I guess I know I am. Um, <laughs> so I'm not working in like laboratory settings for, for the reasons that I sort of outlined in my presentation. I think that, you know, it complements the laboratory setting, but there's also a need to, to study animals for their own sake and sort of think about what would you do if there weren't constraints about, you know, we have to house them like this because this is how the researchers are housing them. Um, but like, well, what 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 happens if you just sort of like try to provide them w with the most optimal life possible, and then see what their behavior is like, and 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 then also see what might they might be missing, and what their social structures are like, um, and sort of the potentiality there. And I think that um, what's changed, and what I've you know found encouragement from, is that. When I first was starting, you know, whenever this cat grant, you know, like five years ago, um, the idea of positive welfare wasn't, it was out there, but it wasn't like, well, obviously we need to do positive welfare. I mean, now it's like people are just sort of like, yeah, it's one of the things to do. You might not work on it, but it's one of the things that you, you know, it's accepted that it's like on, it's on the menu. Um, so that wasn't even the case. And then, and so, so that's, I think, quite a rapid change. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, I think there's also, you know, the department that I'm in now, um, there are spaces opening up, especially, you know, if, if you're a young person and you want to, to help animals and you want to do science, there were a very narrow set of options uh, just 10 years ago. And I think that that range of options has really um, broadened and so that there is a possibility now to engage with science to help animals um, and sort of take an outside the system approach, um, which just absolutely was not available to me when I was an undergraduate. And, and I'm not in any way advocating that that's what everybody should be doing, but it again has just been added to the menu. And I think that there are important contributions that can come and that that's starting to get institutional support, it's starting to get funding support, it's starting to get, you know, course, you know, degree support that, that is generating a space for also that, that approach to complement the other approaches. I would probably agree with what everybody said. Um, I, I really appreciate that Becca is definitely looking at, you know, what does this look like naturally for an animal for it to experience these kind of emotions? What are they capable of? because I think that we're really not even gonna come close to touching that in the laboratory. And, but yet we need some practical applications of, of what can we do now? What can be beneficial now? And I, I do think that, that there's a place for all of those questions. And I think they're all very meaningful. Um, you know, just thinking about how you make these culture changes because Kathy's point is so, so important that these, cultural, these cultures really frame how people perceive animals. Um, I, I always find it really interesting when I tell people that I do research to, to improve the lives of laboratory rodents, I usually get comments like, you, 
aren't they like vermin? Like, I don't like, I don't want them in my house. And so there's this whole cultural sp perspective of some of the species we just, we just work with that culturally they're seen as these, uh, as vermin, you know, spreaders of disease and things like that. And so there's just this cultural um, problem with a lot of the species we work with simply because they're perceived as not having as much intrinsic worth as, as other species. And so that's always something that's going to be hard for us to break through on, a, on specifically our rodents, but um, maybe not as hard with our non-human primates or dogs or things like that. So there's a whole cultural perspective of how we make change and changing the behavior to improve the welfare, but also the cultural aspects of the animals perspectives on the animals themselves that can be uh, problematic depending on which ones we're working with. But um, at least with that social framework that I keep talking about, the theory of planned behavior, it starts looking at social norms. So how do social norms, how does, do other people that you respect do things that influences your own behavior, but also having your ability to control and make change if you think that it's necessary. And so looking at the very as various aspects of how people actually decide to change behavior and which parts might be causing, might be specific barriers versus others that may be um, not as much of a problem. Um, and so that particular framework has been really helpful that we applied in the, in the tickling work to identify what aspects are problematic and what needed to be specifically addressed. So I think there's some, some more systematic ways that we can go about to try to make some of that cultural change, but change is hard and it's always slow and it never goes as fast as we want it to. But I think there are some, some things in place that we can focus on to really try to take those steps forward. Thank you very much uh, for your comments. Um, I really think uh, you are, you know, the 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 ones who will make a difference, or are obviously are already making a difference because you all um, are also teaching, and I think this is very important. Teaching in various ways, like you did, is, is, is providing this platform and educating people. Why pre-registration is important. Kathy obviously has many students. Becca also teaches, Brianna a lot, uh, you teach a lot. So I think that knowledge seems to be key. And, and maybe because you, some of you already mentioned that the younger people, the next generation seems to be a little bit more sensitive or, um, towards those issues. You know, how can we provide a good life for animals in the laboratory? Um, they are very concerned about the animals. I think it also obviously has to do with, with our greater knowledge on, on the capabilities and needs of, of those animals. So this goes hand in hand. So I have a, a question in the, in the chat um, that is quite interesting. Um, which approach do you think would be um, able to make most impact ethics, welfare or reproducibility or lack of? Um, because obviously we talked about all those things. We have, we have an ethical obligation towards those animals. Um, there are those welfare impacts or we can only improve their welfare that much. And we have the reproducibility and translatability issues um, that obviously also have to do with species differences, um, so they cannot truly be erased. So what are your thoughts on that? What's the best approach? I think that, you know, especially if you consider the harm benefit trade off, it, it, you can you can break that model. Either by showing that the harms are more extreme or easily fixable uh, or or by showing that the benefits are really low. Um, and then engaging in the ethical thing. I mean, I guess I should mention again for fish, you know, like one of the issues that, you know, really faces fish is that people still persist in thinking that they're primitive and inferior to us and other animals. And they're just, that's just factually not correct. We're unfamiliar with them and they have a different body plan because they had a different evolutionary trajectory, but they didn't get frozen in time hundreds of millions of years ago. I mean, they evolved as well. So they're not our ancestors, and yet we still think of them as being primitive and lesser than. And so, so there's a huge issue around just, again, coming back to that idea of caring about fish, 
um, and, and all of these other animals as well. I think we under undervalue all of them. And so I think we need to, you know, boost how much we care about them, understand how we can fix things within the system to help animals tomorrow, and understand how that entire structure is built on the premise that we're getting some sort of benefit that we're starting to realize now is much more marginal than we originally believed in terms of the benefit to humans um, and has a lot of problems with it. Like an 11% translation rate is um, something that we need to, it has to be part of the conversation. I mean, there's just no way around that. Um, so I think, and, and, and also one of the things that I feel very strongly is that like, because the answer is all of the above, it's more of a question about yourself. Like, what are you, what motivates you? What are your skill sets? What gets you up in the morning working on these issues? And if it's like ethics, if it's translatability, if it's, you know, working with animals, I think then the answer is it's more about what, it's a more personal question. That's my take on that. Like, I agree uh, all of the above too, but one thing I do like is to, to, to remind people about the ethics sometimes because we do forget that you know the entire enterprise is, 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 is framed from uh, an ethical perspective and, and, and I animal ethics committees, et cetera, governing bodies, it's all based on this of what we currently find. Uh, acceptable and the harm benefit analysis is the main approach. But anyway, so it's good to remind us about that. Uh, you know, it's not just uh, that we are obligated and we've agreed as society to, to, you know, maximize benefits, minimize harms. And so as Becca points out, it, it's a good reminder. If we're not doing that, then we need to constantly be pushing to do that. I really liked uh, Becca's comment on that. It's, it's a very personal decision because yes, they're all involved, but you know, what's passionate for you? What's the reason for why you're doing what you're doing? I think that really resonated with me just thinking about me myself when I'm talking to other people about what I do. Um, I emphasize things differently depending on what I think is important to those people to try to make them change their behavior. So when I'm talking to a scientist, I'm talking about the reproducibility. Um, even though for me personally, it's all about the welfare of the animals and making sure that they have the best life that I can possibly provide them. Um, but I often don't tell people that because I know that's not what is important to them when I'm trying to get them to convince them to do something. And so, and that always is, is difficult for me because I want to impress upon people why I think it's important, but I know that that just because I think it's important doesn't necessarily mean that they will take that to heart and change what they're doing and that I have to convince them based on what they think is important, but that just really illustrates the point that Becca came up with that, you know, it's different for everyone and it, one is not necessarily wrong compared to the others, but just really it's a personal decision. So. I thought that was a, a really great point that she brought up. I agree with, uh, of course, with all of you. That's something personal that drives you want why you want to change. But also, I think you can look at groups or organizations and that everyone has a different role in this discussion. Because there was also a question in the chat uh, with um, um, activists, like who are uh, against animal testing uh, in general. Um, sometimes we look at those groups as something bad, like they they are they sometimes destroy uh, animal experiments because they want to release uh, uh, animals, for example. But I think also these kind of groups have an, an important role in this whole discussion because they keep pointing us out what we're doing and why we're doing, and we have to explain and give uh, explain why we want to use animals in the first place. So it we have uh, as researchers also a um, role in society and explain to society what we're doing. So uh, making our research open and showing what we're doing, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And um, the question that was asked was also um, um, how are we going to protect the researchers from these animal rights activists? 
Um, first of all, I think uh, you publish your paper, so people already know that you're working with animals in the first place. So making it uh, a pre-registration doesn't really add to that. Um, and secondly, I think it, uh, it also opens up room for uh, for discussion with the general public. What are you doing and why you're doing it? And it doesn't mean that uh, that everyone will be against it if you explain um, explain what you're doing. Um, so um, yeah, every everything everyone has a different role in this uh, in these discussions. Okay, then another question I'm I'm a little bit curious about, um, and I'm sure uh, several of the early career scientists and students um, that are online today. Um, what were some events in your careers that made you change, or you know, obviously you didn't you didn't you weren't a little girl thinking, okay, I'm going to improve um, the lives of rats and mice in the laboratory. Um, so I think it, if, if it's not a too long question, obviously, um, if you want to say just a few sentences, uh, how you got into the field, how, what, what is driving you every day? Because as we know, it is difficult to make a difference for animals in the laboratory, but uh, you are all engaged um, in improving lives of uh, animals. So I would be interested in that. I mean, I can say that, and it probably relates to some of the research interests that I have in particular, human animal relationships. I can say without a doubt, you know, in my youth, um, I grew up in East Africa and Tanzania, and we spent a lot of time on safari uh, looking at animals. And basically, you know, just, and it, it is a bit, it's just exposure to the amazingness of animals, right? And it just is so fascinating and so enthralling. And it's just like, I, I so I followed that path for, in a variety of different ways. Uh, that's why I started in wildlife biology, because because I was interested in just what animals do and why, but also I came to learn through that wildlife biology research path I became more aware of conservation. I was concerned about studying these animals and, and worried at the same time that some animals are going extinct and stuff. Uh, and so that kind of got me more into the people side of things. Um, so I've always had it, that just fascination with animals and that, that for me has also led me to an interest in just protecting their individual welfare, but also their populations and stuff like that. And, and I don't know, the rest is history. <laughs> maybe maybe I can add so for me it was uh, so um, um, I like to do the the research in a very proper way so like with sample size calculations and like look at the experimental designs that I can do and um, one at one time I was completely shocked because I was um, planning an experiment and I did a sample size uh, calculation for how many mice I would need for my uh, for my study and I was discussing this uh, in a group and then one of the more senior researchers told me like yeah just just do more mice there are only 10 euros uh, a piece and then that just that comment just like blew my head off. I was like, are we really discussing this on the amount of money that a mouse uh, uh, costs that we're uh, doing these experiments? So that uh, that really like opened up a whole new dimension to this whole discussion for me. So that made me think like, I wanna work on this and make people think differently about these experiments. It's not about the money that a mouse is costing, it's why you're using it and if you need uh, 10 mice or you need 20 mice that it, it depends on the research question and what you're going to do and not about the not amount of money so that really made me uh, want to work in this uh, in this field uh, yeah I actually was a little girl and wanted to work with fish I don't know why <laughs> I honest I mean um, and like yeah, I wanted to help them. Uh, and, and, and so, so definitely one of the problems that I had is that, you know, the, the career path was very un, unclear. And so it's been very um, windy for me. Um, and the things that have changed 
me along the way is very much like what Kathy was saying that like it was the experiences with the animals themselves and like really sort of when I started working with the zebrafish I wanted to walk in without any biases and not think of them as primitive or inferior or incapable and they still surprised me with how responsive they were how much you know uh engagement they had with each other and with me and how they you know I, it's still I, I i still they they i feel like i learned a lot from the fish themselves and um and and then i think the the main other thing has been colleagues and finding like-minded people um, because we are a pretty small field it's hard to remember that like some people don't even know what animal welfare is. I had that experience with my students. I just took it as a given that these undergraduates would know. And like, it turns out that they didn't know that it was like a field, you know, it's not like they understood the words, but they didn't understand it was like an option. And so I think that that for me was absolutely true. And then what's changed really changed my, my, thinking about these issues is colleagues and being able to find like-minded people because it's not necessarily like it's not an obvious career trajectory and so like just finding people who say yeah you should be working on that that's really interesting or you know like have you thought about thinking about it this way you know and, and really changing my my perspective so that's been huge i think probably crucial so So for me, um, kind of similar to everybody else, I was just always fascinated by animals and why they did what they did, um, whether in a natural setting or, you know, just even watching a family pet. Um, and even I, I grew up with quite a few rodents um, as a kid and just absolutely loved them. Uh, I remember giving them all kinds of enrichment and I didn't even know what enrichment was because I just loved watching them engage with their environment. And, um, you know, just kind of originally thinking that I wanted to do something, you know, purely in behavior and ultimately using mice as kind of a model species. And then as I kind of got into that's kind of what changed my perspective is that um, there was so much to be done with rodents because, you know, as we've talked about often or as Becca mentioned, these a lot of these species seen as inferior species and that cultural that we we've, we've mentioned behind them and, and people just not really thinking that they're smart or they um, can engage in these, in these different behaviors or that they didn't even exist. And so um, giving them the right environments to express those behaviors was so important and so exciting for me to see that happen and, and still happens to me today, kind of like Becca was saying, um, you know, putting, in, putting them in different experiences and seeing these behaviors that I've never seen before is always so exciting to me because at this point I, I've watched so, so much rodent behavior, I always think there's nothing else I can find or see because I think I've seen it all, but then they always surprise you. So I think for me, that's been kind of the um, experience as well is that uh, experiences with the animals themselves have really kind of changed my perspective and trajectory. Um, but also the fact that um, I didn't know that welfare science was a field either uh, going into college and even after college, I didn't, uh, my undergraduate degree didn't really even know that that was a thing, kind of just stumbled into it to be perfectly honest. And um, finding some really great people who had the same passions that I, I had, maybe for different species or different aspects of animal welfare, but um, you know, just really getting you excited to come to work every day. And um, so yeah, that's probably been my perspective as well. So thank you so much for sharing your, your yeah, experiences and what motivates you, because I think, um, as you said, there are some people who don't even know that there's a field um, that's called animal welfare or animal welfare science. Um, it is a science. Um, it's very important to make it a science because we need evidence-based uh, approaches, obviously. Um, there was a question in the chat about courses, available courses. And I think there's way more out there than one would think. 
Um, so just maybe if you want to share some thoughts, um, I can post in the chat. Um, there's a new um, course series uh, that is actually um, initiated by the European Commission because in the European Union you have to train before you are allowed to work with animals. And so um, there's a, a number of um, courses now or uh, modules, better to say, uh, in the three R's. Um, and um, I was happy to review the refinement um, modules that are done by Professor Paul Flecknell. And I can post um, the website um, so you know where to find that. And there will be more added. And the good thing about this, but, but you can obviously add other, other ideas, the good thing is that you can add to this website. That's the idea um, at the moment. And I will post it. So you can add courses. So if you have a, an, a valuable course you want to add to this website, um, you can. And I think that's a great idea to to have a like a knowledge um, yeah, um, base or whatever to 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 have one place to go to to find many um, online modules you can take for free. And also, um, just to add the refinement course um, that we recently uh, put together for Johns Hopkins, we plan to put that on Coursera probably next year. We were hoping this year, but um, we want to, we need to do some more for that. It takes longer um, than thought. So, but that's also in the making. There are several things on Coursera, but now please um, let me know what you think, what uh, resources you have, you can share maybe. So obviously there are, um, you know, courses that you can take at universities that have programs specializing in behavior, psychology, that sort of area. Um, and that's just going to be very institution specific. Um, and those resources are not always the easiest to find. Um, but in terms of free courses, I mean, you can take the rat tickling course for free. Um, but I do know that there are some initiatives and, and Catherine, you and I may want to talk about this offline, but um, uh, the North American 3Rs Collaborative is in the process of developing a North American 3Rs related modules that, um, and that would provide some type of certificate at the end um, that's currently in development. And so hopefully those will be available um, in the next year or so. And so um, that would be something that hopefully those of us in North America who obviously have slightly different rules and regulations and things like that, that um, would be specific to, to this particular region, so. So if nobody has to add anything now, um, actually um, my boss, uh, Professor Thomas Hartung, he also uh, made a comment in the chat. He said, uh, he thanks the panelists for these impressive presentations showing your dedication. And um, also he says refinement is never enough, but only replacement is neither. So yeah, we, we are on a road, I would say. We, we are trying to reduce animal use. We are trying to refine the, the lives or improve the lives of animals in the laboratory. And we are trying to yeah, move towards um, more human relevant models where possible. I think this is a, a delicate discussion, obviously, um, but I think it's important to continue this discussion because obviously, as we said, there's only so much improvement that we can make in terms of the so-called animal models. And sometimes we just have to acknowledge that something, you know, a particular, yeah, animal model doesn't work and uh, we have to look for alternatives and uh, better ways of, um, doing um, the research. So maybe I do one last round for everybody to say fi some final words, uh, thoughts, ideas still on how to improve the situation because you are, you've done amazing research and shown amazing things uh, that could improve animals' lives, um, but we need to implement them more and yeah, find ways to get more funding, obviously, for that, um, and so on and so forth. So I would ask you for some final words you have, thoughts you have. Um, my, my final thoughts are just keep at it. Um, you know, we talked about change is slow. 
um, and it can be frustrating at times, uh, but just um, keep on swimming, thinking of uh, Finding Nemo, just keep on swimming. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to, I'm, I look forward to the day where I'm completely out of a job because we were no longer using animals in, in research and, and, and experimentation. Um, and so I, I fully welcome that day. Um, but then, um, uh, yeah, just uh, kind of keep on working and um, yeah, hopefully we'll get there soon. I guess I'll add one thing that just hasn't been brought up, not not that it's maybe my final word, but just maybe is important to acknowledge is uh, issues around transparency and about animal research. And maybe that's also really important, right? It, I think it does help to have, you know, pressures uh, from people outside the research community to 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 improve things. And and it also helps to have people who are well informed about how things are going in research and you know there's a lot of issues around transparency and there is an increased interest in it but ultimately i do think it will serve a benefit uh by letting members in society uh, especially in you know it is publicly funded to be more to be involved um and then um you know because even at a institutional level like ubc i think it's really helpful you know, having students be um, demanding for, you know, more to, for change, because um, that that's important to senior administration and public relations, and they do respond to those kinds of things. And it can trickle down, like in our case, you know, we created an animal welfare committee, because there was this drive to input refinements and improve welfare, you know, so there's some, some, some real impacts from from allowing more people uh, to be involved in the conversation. So maybe I can add to that because transparency, uh, that's uh, something that uh, we are uh, striving for as well with the open science. So that's also uh, what I would like to uh, highlight here, be open about what you do on all aspects. So uh, about your plan, about what you're actually doing, about your results, also about things that don't work. Uh, about failures that you have, share them so people can learn from it and you can reflect on it together. And uh, now I think we're kind of afraid sometimes to be open also about things that don't work. Uh, and it makes makes it you feel like you're alone on things that maybe don't work that well and because no one's sharing. So I think that can help the field as well. Uh, just be open about everything and try to learn from each other's failures and from your own failures. That's all great. And I'll just end on a wildly optimistic note that I don't necessarily believe in. But, you know, when change happens, it's very hard to predict when and how change happens. And things, public opinion can flip uh, quite radically and quite quickly. And um, so I think that it's, you know, even though it, it might be frustrating to think about how long these changes take to implement, I think that it, it would be wise to also um, make space for a reality that could happen quite soon, quite quickly, that is optimal. And that, you know, if we don't describe it and live in it, at least some of the time, then it definitely won't happen. And so, you know, thinking about what uh, what it would mean to actually have or Bri Brianna switch to a different job, let's say not be out of a job, but switch to a different job. And, and you know, that, that, that it would be like a, a radical change where we really are taking animal lives seriously and prioritizing them um, and recognizing that this isn't coming at a cost to us, but as coming to a benefit to, to humans as well in our relationship with animals and the rest of the world. Thank you so much um, for your final thoughts on this. Um, yeah, I agree with all of you and I'm very grateful for your passion to make a difference for non-human animals. Um, I think we funded the right people <laughs> to say that. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, we had almost 200 people online today. There was a lot of interest in this topic. Um, maybe we should have a follow up sometime. Um, we are going to um, edit the recording and then um, post the recording. I will make sure to inform everybody who signed up because, um, yeah, just that you know if you want to see that again.
thanks again for your time and yeah for your amazing work and take care everybody mm -hmm.